All right, so Psalm 103. Uh, how many of you know what an acrostic is? Yeah, you school teachers do, right? So it's like you're writing a poem, and the first line starts with an A. The, the, the second line starts with a B. So uh, if you were to be writing a poem about me, the first word would probably be awesome, you know, and then the next, word would, next line would start with brave, you know, and third line would be crusty, and it would just go downhill from there. But anyway, just... Uh, uh, we don't spell it like Krusty the Crab. That starts with a K. But anyway, um, this, song, this, this psalm tonight is an acrostic of the Hebrew alphabet. We won't get into that because uh, we probably don't understand all that, but that's just a, a fun fact for you. Uh, psalm 103 is an acrostic using the Hebrew alphabet. But this psalm is a, it is a call to worship. It's a call to worship. And uh, uh, it, it calls us to uh, to, to praise the Lord, to, to have a desire to lift something up to Him that is pleasing to Him. And uh, I want you to notice a couple of things right from the start. We won't uh, read through the whole thing. We'll just kind of take it off. And we'll, we'll, we'll bite off one piece at a time. So verse 1, I want you to notice a couple things right here from the start. Verse 1, it says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and all that is within me. Bless His holy name. The first thing that I want you to notice there is the very uncommon way that David expresses this. Uh, a lot of these psalms that we've been reading, he says, praise the Lord. Uh, but here he says, bless the Lord. And this is kind of the opposite of the way we normally pray. Normally when we're praying, when we're, when we're praying to the Lord, we say, Lord, bless me. Lord, help me. Lord, do something good for me. Help, help me in my finances. Uh, Fix, you know, help, help heal my family, uh, help heal my body, and give me good health. We pray for the Lord to get us through uh, the next day, to, to provide everything. We, we're always saying, Lord, bless me. But here, David says kind of the opposite of that. He turns that around, and he says, bless the Lord. He's saying, I want to do, I want to be a blessing to you, Lord. I want to do something. I want to express something. I want to live my life in such a way that I can bring pleasure to you, Lord, and make you feel blessed. Isn't that a great way for David to feel? Amen. Isn't that a great desire for him to want to be pleasing to the Lord? We're always asking the Lord for something, but David says, I want to do something that will be a blessing to my God. I want to bless the Lord. Now, that's the first thing I wanted you to notice. The second thing I want you to notice is to whom David is speaking here, to whom David is pleading here, who is he encouraging uh, in, in this passage? That's the second thing I want you to notice. And look, just look at the words. He says, bless the Lord who? Oh, my soul. Oh, my soul. And all that is within who? Me, all that is within me, bless his holy name. It's clear David is speaking to himself. And you think, well, why is David talking to himself like that? Well, just think about this. You, you know, we come to church. We have worship time. We just had one. We, we sang that song. It was a really good worshipful song. Um, we, we, we come and we participate. We sing. Uh, some of you sing louder than others. Uh, some of you should sing quieter than others, but, uh, but some of you raise your hand. Some of you are prayerful when you're singing. We, we have different ways in which we worship, but, but David says, bless the Lord, O my soul. He's speaking to the innermost part of his being, he's talking to himself, not like a crazy person, but, he, but he's speaking to himself, encouraging himself within his soul. And he says, all that is within me. Bless His holy name. I mean, we, we go through worship and we do all the things that we do, but, but let's ask the question, when we are doing this, are we ever distracted? Are, are we fully focused on the God that we're to be worshiping? Or, or are we just simply going through the motions on the outside? Of, I mean, we know it's time for church, so we go to church and, and we sing the songs, we look at the screen, we, 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 we recite the words, uh, we listen to the music. But are we fully focused or are we thinking about Taco Bell afterwards? Are we thinking about something, you know, some fight that we had with somebody? Are we thinking about um, something that's just we shouldn't be thinking about? We don't have our focus on God. And David says, you know, we shouldn't be like that. I don't want my worship to be like that. I want my worship to be 100 percent 
tuned into God. He says, I, I want to be all in when I'm worshiping you. He says, bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Not just making, not just going through the motions on the outside, not just doing something on the outside of my body, but in my soul, I'm worshiping God. He says, and all that is within me, 100%, that I am worshiping God with all my heart. We shouldn't be distracted. And, and David wants to do that. And, and so he says, bless the Lord, O oh my what? My soul. And all that is within me, bless his holy name. So that's the second thing I kind of wanted you to notice that David's encouraging himself to worship the Lord and to be, be, to be focused in on it, to, to worship the Lord with all his heart. Now, why does David feel so passionately about this? Why is it that David is so fired up about worshiping God? Well, obviously, we have a great God. Obviously, he deserves it. And I want you to see what David says about this in verse 2. He says, again, he says, Bless the Lord, O my soul, and forget not, okay, and, and, and we don't really talk that way. We, say, we would say, don't forget, in the way we speak today, forget not all his, what? Benefits. Okay, and, and, and David is talking about the fact that we have a God who does good things for us, doesn't he? Isn't he good? Doesn't he do good things for us? We have a God who does great, he, who has done great things for us. He has blessed us in so many great ways. We can never name all the good things, all the great things that God has done for us. And nevertheless, David is about to remind us of some of those great things. And not only is he going to remind us of those things, he's going to warn us that we should never forget about those things. Don't forget what God has done for you. We shouldn't be forgetful, should we? We should always remember what God has done for us. So, verse 3, what has God done for us? The third verse, he says, who forgives all your iniquities. I mean all of them. And we say that. We, we talk about that a lot. We talk about the fact that God has forgiven our sins. We preach about that a lot. And, and we talk about it. And I've heard people pray in church, God, thank you for forgiving my sins. But you, you all know as well as I do, when you hear something that's repeated a lot, you, you hear this, it's, it's kind of like a, you hear a motor running outside and then it kind of, you get used to it. You hear jets flying over in this area in which we live, right? And, and, and eventually you just, you just, you just kind of adjust the level at which you're saying something when the jet's flying over and you're talking to your wife and she's like, why are you yelling at me? The jet's gone, you know. But uh, we, we tend to kind of forget the significance of it when we've heard it a lot. We get desensitized to the, it is a big deal that God has forgiven us all our iniquity. He forgives all our iniquity, and we don't want to get desensitized. David is telling us, don't forget this. And I would tell you, don't ever get used to this, that God has forgiven your sins. We need to forever be amazed by the fact that such a holy God loved us enough, even when we were still vile and offensive in his sight by our sin, even when we were still so messed up, he still loved us. While we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. He sent his son to pay the price for our sins on that cross so we could be forgiven. Don't ever forget that God forgives your sin. Isn't that great? It's a great thing God does. Another thing God does, verse 3 continues, he says, who heals all your diseases. Isn't that a, a good thing to hear during a time like this and everybody's afraid they're going to get sick? He heals all your diseases. He not only forgives all your iniquities, but he heals all your diseases. He forgives you even when you come in late to church. He, <laughs> just kidding. <laughs> I love it. I am glad that you're here, buddy. I am glad that you're here. <laughs> just had to take a cheap shot. Anyway, I wore a Western shirt to impress you tonight. I thought it's got pearl snaps on it. Pearl snaps? Yeah. I told Bridget, I can't wait to wear this for Jeremy. Anyway, I thought. But he, he not only forgives all your sins, but he heals all your diseases. Now, there's several kinds of healing through which God works. And we, we know that. We, we've seen the way that God heals. 
And there's, are y'all having problems tonight? <laughs> so, Jonathan's on one side of the room. Katie hits the other side. She likes Bridget better. <laughs> anyway, Jonathan's going to have to forgive all your iniquities tonight. But uh, anyway, uh, uh, he heals all our diseases. There's several ways that God uh, heals the, the way that God works. There's, there's one way that God has built into us, with, and it's natural healing, right? Natural healing. Uh, and, and that's uh, like you, you, you cut your finger, you know, and the, then it's bleeding, but then it starts to clot, and then, you, you know, you get a little scab, and it stops bleeding, and, and so then it, the scab gets smaller and smaller, the skin grows up around it, and the scab kind of falls off, and, you, and your, your skin is healed. It's like it was never there, you, unless it's a really bad cut, but you still have a scar, and, and God put that natural process of healing in her. There's natural healing that takes place in our bodies, and, and God put that in us. God heals, it says here, all our diseases. There's also therapeutic healing, and uh, uh, sometimes you might have a cut that's a little worse than another one, and it's having a hard time healing. So then you go to the doctor, and he puts you on Cipro, and that stuff makes you feel lousy, but, but he gives you that medicine. It starts, it starts helping that wound heal, you know, or you, or you go to the doctor, and you have a surgery for something, and uh, that helps you heal from the problem you had. Maybe cuts something out of your body that shouldn't be there. Or he maybe puts you on some medicine to help you uh, heal. You get therapeutic healing. And I believe that God works through doctors. These doctors are a gift. And medicines are a gift that God's given us. You know, Luke was a physician. And then there's also, though, a third kind of healing. There's miraculous healing. Like, like Jesus, you know, when he was uh, over at uh, Peter's house in, in, in the New Testament and, and he Remember, Peter's mother was laying there on the couch sick, and, and uh, Jesus came over. She had a fever, and Jesus came over and healed her, and she got up, and she cooked, and she served everybody, you know. It's a good thing he healed her, because none of those men were going to cook and serve everybody, you know. But he healed her. And then I've also heard somebody say, you know, that uh, that was his, Peter's mother-in-law, you know, that, he, that, he, that, that Jesus healed. And I've also heard somebody say that was one of the reasons Jesus was denied by Peter, because Jesus healed his mother-in-law, you know. <laughs> but I don't know. But... Uh, <laughs> Yeah, okay, you got it. <laughs> Didn't want him to heal his mother law <laughs> Anyway, but uh, <laughs> there's miraculous healing. Jesus uh, healed that cripple out there by the pool of Bethesda. He'd been, what, 36, 38, 38 years maybe? I think 38 years. He had been out there and, and right there by the temple, you know, and nobody ever helped, none of the religious leaders could ever help him in that dead, dead legalistic religion. But Jesus came out there and told him, get up and, and he, and he got up, and he was, he's, he's no longer crippled. And, and uh, Jesus uh, healed him. Or like the ten lepers, you know, and Jesus healed him. And only one came back and gave thanks. And nine of them just went their way and forgot that the Lord healed them. And, and David's telling us here, forget not all his benefits, who forgives all, who, all your iniquities, who heals all your diseases. And I believe that, you know, God still miraculously heals people today. I, I do believe that God still, I, I have been with people. I, I've, I've been to the hospital a lot with people. When, you know, when the doctor, uh, they went in for surgery, the doctor came out and talked to the family and said, uh, I don't know, the, the cancer was there. But, uh, you know, and God's people have been praying. It was there. And, and we were going to take it out, but it's not there anymore. I can't explain it. I don't know what happened. I know, <laughs> because God reached down in his, in his grace, his mercy, and, and healed that person. God still does miraculous miracles today. And, uh, uh, and, and we see it happen from time to time. But that doesn't always happen, which, which brings us to a fourth kind of way that God heals. And, and we don't think about this one nearly as much, but it's simply when God just takes a person and brings them on home to heaven and gives them the very best healing that there is uh, uh, the Lord in His great sovereignty and His wisdom just takes somebody home and they don't suffer ever again. You know, when, when, you, when, when Jesus healed somebody physically, He healed that crippled man, there would come a day when that crippled man would not be able to walk again physically. You know, He healed somebody physically. And if you remember the, the story where the, the friends, you know, the four friends lower down their, their friend while Jesus is teaching. Can you imagine trying to preach and plaster's falling on your head and everything while you're trying to preach? And you think, what is this? Come on, guys. But they, these guys want to get their friend to Jesus, and, and he lowers them down there. And, and there he is, and Jesus says to him, 
Your sins are forgiven you. Now, Jesus looked at that person, and he could see the big need that he had, you know. And they, they said, this man blasphemes. Uh, no one can forgive sins but God. And Jesus said that you may know that the Son of Man hath power on earth to forgive sins. Take up, rise, take up your bed and walk. Jesus physically healed the, the person, but, but, but the a better thing, the, the greater thing was that he forgave gave his sins. And he heals all our diseases. And, and, and you know, you can forgive somebody, you, you can heal somebody for a little while physically, but they're going to get sick again. They're eventually going to die. You know, Hezekiah was healed, but 15 years later, he died. He physically died. He had to go through sickness again, and he, and he died 15 years later. And it's, uh, it's, it's something that happens. But when somebody, uh, when the Lord in his great mercy and his wisdom reaches down and takes somebody to heaven, he's healing them for eternity. And remember what the Apostle Paul said over there in Philippians in, in chapter 2. He said that, you know, to, to be here, it's needful. I wanna, I, I'm stuck between two things, you know, and, and I, I, I could stay here for your benefit. But to go home, he says it would, he, he says it would be far better, right, to be home with the Lord. It would be far better, he says. And, and so uh, we, uh, we look at that and, and, and we're amazed by that. We, we think about that. He says, to, I have a desire to depart and be with Christ, which would be far better. And it would be for us to be able to go on to heaven. You know, uh, I like the old movie where the guys are out there hoeing in the garden. And the, one of the old guys says, what are we doing this for? I hate this. And he says, it's good for you. It's gardening. It's what old people do. He says, it's good for you. It'll make you live to be 100. And he picks up his hoe and he throws it. He says, you live to be 100, you know. And I, I, I like that, you know, because heaven's going to be a wonderful, wonderful place. And it's far better to live with Christ. But uh, and w and when somebody dies, don't you ever say that God didn't heal them. If they're a Christian, God just gave them the best healing there is. That's the very best healing that there is. And uh, again, I would say to you, don't ever forget, not only that God forgives all our iniquities, but he heals all our diseases. And then verse 4, he goes on, he says, who redeems your life from destruction. Not only forgives your iniquities, he not only heals your diseases, he redeems your life from destruction. Are you getting the richness of this, this meal we're eating tonight here? This is good, isn't it? He redeems your life from destruction. Now, that word destruction uh, in the scripture, you, it's synonymous with, with uh, death. It's synonymous with grave. It's synonymous with the pit. It's even synonymous with hell. And hasn't Jesus done that? Redeemed our life from destruction. He has, he has redeemed our life from destruction. Uh, he has purchased, and that word redeemed, he it means he's purchased us. He has purchased our lives back, not with the corruptible things such as silver or gold, but with the precious blood of Jesus Christ. We have been redeemed. Guys, don't ever forget this. This, this is and always will be a big deal that Christ has redeemed our lives from destruction. Verse 4 goes on. It says, who crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercies. It's still, this, this gets better. All right, now just, just think about how incredibly galactically enormous this is. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy. Think about that, that statement. It's a powerful statement. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy. God is a king, right? God is king. He is king of kings. Jesus is king of kings and Lord of lords. If there's a royal crown to be worn, whose head should it be upon? It should be upon his head, right? Upon the head of the Lord Jesus. It should be upon his glorious head. Yet his love for you and me is so deep and, and so powerful that from the moment he redeemed us and he adopted us into his into his family, he has begun to put crowns upon your head and my head, crowns of loving kindness and tender mercy surrounding us with loving kindness and 
tender mercies. And it is in his heart to prepare you and me, to prepare us uh, for a time when you're going to rule and reign with him in his kingdom. Revelation chapter 20 tells us that. Because blessed is he who has part in the first resurrection. Over such the second death has no power but they shall be kings, they, they shall be priests of God and of Christ and shall be, reign with him a thousand years. He's going to reign with him in his kingdom. He crowns you with loving kindness and tender mercy. And David continues in verse 5, he says, Who satisfies your mouth. Now, I'm a, you, you don't have to study much about me to understand I, I enjoy my food. Right? I smoked a brisket the other night. I got to say, it turned out good. It was, I've enjoyed. I've been back to that dish several times since I finished cooking it. And, and I have just, in, I've, I've had it with, I've, I've eaten the, bar, the brisket with barbecue sauce. I have eaten it warm with barbecue sauce and cold with barbecue sauce. Either way, it's great. I have eaten it, eaten it with queso smothered all over it. Oh, no, don't knock it. It is good. <laughs> it, is, it is a little piece of heaven. Queso all over brisket. Uh, it, it is delectable. And uh, you won't be sorry. I mean, I don't care. It's worth it. I mean, it, it didn't do too good on my tummy, but it, it, it was good in my mouth, and I enjoyed it. But uh, anyway, it seems to the person who just loves to eat and probably eats too much that it never seems to be satisfied. In life, we can indulge in temptations that we never seem to be satisfied. But God has a way of satisfying our mouths with good things so that your youth is renewed like the eagles. We, we, we see so much worry in this world, we, uh, so much fear. Our Lord is the answer to all of that. Our Lord is the answer to every... He takes such good care of us. No matter what's happening around us, it, it, this is a cursed world that we'll, we live in, and it'll take everything away from you, and it'll leave you feeling miserable. It'll leave you feeling empty. Our Lord, though, will take such good, loving, wonderful care of us. He will, he will provide us all the good things we need, just like He provided for the Israelites. When He led them through... Where did He lead them through? The wilderness. And, and another word we have for that, the blazing hot sun and the desert. The desert. desert. It's, a, it's a terrible place to live. But yet he brought these people through that wilderness and, and he fed them out there and he gave them water out there and he, he gave them shade. You know, you, shade is a big deal out there in the desert, isn't it? The older I get, the more I think about trying to work as much as I can in the shade. Okay? That's something, yeah, the older you get, you just want to do that more often. And, and working in the shade, but the Lord gave them shade. That's a big deal out there in the desert when the sun's just beating down and the heat's out there on a day like this. You really think about that. He gave them shade. He satisfied their mouths. They went through that wilderness. Their shoes didn't wear out. Their clothes didn't wear out. They didn't get sick. They were eating the Lord's diet, drinking the water that he gave them, uh, made run it flow out of a rock. And the Lord satisfied their mouths with Good things. And uh, the world around us, you know, it's people worry, they're afraid. The world may be losing it, but God has a special eye on us, and He knows how to renew our youth like the eagles. We're not wasting away. Our life's not running out, and we're not going to perish. We, we are in the Lord's hand. We still have, and even if we physically die, we still have eternity to go. When we've been there 10,000 years, bright shining as the sun, we've no less days to sing God's praise than when we first begun. God knows how to satisfy our mouth with good things so that our youth is renewed like the eagle. Man, that's a big thing because I'm getting older all the time, right? And to have your youth renewed like the eagles. You know, we're, we're going to be in heaven. And, and, and we're, gonna, we're not going to feel old anymore. Isn't that a, kind of a good thing? Yeah, I mean, I know some of you, I guess you young guys don't even think about that. But, but uh, the, more, the older I get, the more I think. But we're going to be in heaven. And our youth is going to be renewed. 
We're not going to be old and, and, and struggling around anymore. And we're going to, we're going to be, uh, have our youth renewed. And, and that's going to be really good. I, I, I think that's a wonderful thing to look forward to. Now watch this because this is just absolutely magnificent. It's going to change gears here a little bit. Because we're hearing about all these great things God has done. Okay, But verse 6, he says, David says, The Lord executes righteousness and justice for all who are oppressed. He made known his ways to Moses, his acts to the children of Israel. So what, what do we learn from that verse? The Lord executes what? Righteousness and what? Justice for all who are oppressed. And so if someone oppresses the poor, what does the Lord do to that oppressor? He punishes them. He executes justice for the oppressed. He made his known, ways known to Moses and his acts to the children of Israel. We understand, we know from this that the Lord is a judge who punishes evildoers. He showed that to Moses out there in the wilderness. He showed that to the Israelites out there in the wilderness. They saw what God did to Pharaoh. They saw what God did to the armies of Egypt. They saw them at the bottom of the Red Sea. They saw that. He, God punished the wicked. He punished the oppressors. David's making it clear here that the holy God we're talking about here is a God of judgment who will punish sin. But watch this. In verse number 9, he says, I mean, verse number 8, he says, The Lord is merciful and gracious, slow to anger. I like that, right? Because I know some people that are kind of the opposite of that. <laughs> Real quick to get fighting mad. Real quick to get fighting angry. The Lord is merciful and gracious and slow to anger. And what? Abounding in mercy. And you take that abounding, you take that mercy that God has, whatever idea you have of it, and you multiply it times itself. And you multiply it times itself. And you multiply that times itself. And that's what abounding means. It, 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 it's more than you can imagine. He is abounding in mercy. Even though he's a judge, he's also a God of great mercy. The, the way God dealt with Pharaoh is far different from the way he deals with us his children. It's far different. He's poured out upon us grace upon grace upon grace and mercy upon mercy, multiplied in abundance. So much mercy, and we know it. We're still thinking about those sins at the beginning of this that He has forgiven us all our iniquities. All of them. All of them. Bridget still hadn't forgiven me for not taking her to El Chico that night. Still had, but but the Lord has forgiven me all my iniquities. There's nothing He hasn't forgiven. And look at verse three. He, he kind of goes back through that process again. He will not strive. He will not always strive with us. What's strive mean? What's strive mean? Come on, Katie, grab hold of my hand. Wrestling, right? It's trying to get you in line. Can't get you in line. Okay, it's enough. He won't always strive with us forever. He will not always struggle with us and wrestle with us, trying to get us to conform to His will. We have to remember it is His kindness that leads us to repentance. But He will not always strive with us. There is a point at which God says, that's enough. Pours out His judgment. There's a point. He said to, to, to Noah in Genesis chapter 6, my spirit shall not always strive with man, for he's also flesh. And he poured out a judgment on a very wicked world in those days. He will not always strive with us. N nor, though, verse 9, second part of verse 9, nor will he keep his anger forever. He won't be angry forever. If he does get angry, he won't hold his anger forever. You see, God is a judge. And he's a God of, of wrath, but he's also a God of great mercy. And that's what we see here. He's a great, merciful God. Verse 10, and I love verse 10. This is the story of my life. He has not dealt with us according to our sins, nor punished us according to our iniquities. That's my story right there. And I'm sticking to it. 
He has not punished me like I deserve to be punished. Isn't that right? If, if he had, if he, if he had given me what I deserve, I'd be in hell right now. I would not be here. I would be in hell. Aren't you glad God has not dealt with us according to our sins? Yeah. I'm so glad. And, and he explains, he goes a little further, verse 11. For as the heavens are high above the earth. Now that's high, isn't it? I go up on top of a big tall building. It doesn't really have to be a real tall. I just go up on that tower at Six Flags. You know, the one that, that old Eric. And I, I look down through that grate and I'm like, oh. that just freaks me out. I don't like being up that high. I don't like being in an airplane. Now I'll do it. But I don't like doing it. I don't like being up that high. But as high as the heavens are above, as the, as the heavens are high above the earth, this is very high. For, for as the heavens are high above the earth, so great is his mercy toward those for, who fear him. As far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. And I love that he says the east from the west. He doesn't say the north from the south. Because you can travel north and you can keep on going north, but you're going to hit the north pole and then you reach south. Once you get to the North Pole, you can, you can measure between north and south. But you cannot measure between east and west. You start traveling east, and you're, you just keep going, and you'll never be traveling west in that direction. Just keep going east. And if you turn around and you're going west, you can never, you, you can't measure it. It's, it's, and so that's why the Lord in his wisdom said, as far as the east is from the west. I told David to write that. It's as far as the east is from the west, so far has he removed our transgressions from us. That's a long way. Thank God. Thank God for that. So verse 13, as a father pities his children, so the Lord pities those who fear him. For he knows our frame. He remembers that we are dust. Think about how sensitive the Lord is to us. As a father pities his children, he knows our frame. He knows how fragile we are. He knows that we're dust. He knows we can die. And so he considers that. He considers our weaknesses, and he has compassion on us. I think about it, as a father pities his children. I can remember when Brett was just a little guy, and we went out somewhere, and he acted like a little heathen the whole time we were out there, embarrassed me in front of my friends, acting like a little bad boy, and just acting terrible. And I stopped, and I took him by the arm, and I said, when we get home, I'm going to wear you out. And all of a sudden, just... He went into a mode of complete repentance. And he straightened up and he didn't act bad any of the, the rest of that night. And it was like he was opening the door for his mama and he was cleaning up behind everybody and he was quiet as a little church mouse. He was so sweet and so good and so kind. And we got home and I knew I had told him I was going to wear him out. And so we got home and we started walking back down the hallway towards his bedroom where he knew that Judgment was about to fall upon him. And as we rounded the corner in his door, he said, Daddy? And I said, Yes, son. He said, Can you just give me a little one? <laughs> I said, Yes, yeah, son. And so we just got one that night. I didn't really wear him out, but... Were you fragile on his frame? <laughs> yeah. It was easy on him. As a father pities his children, I think that ride home was probably worse than any whooping I could have given him. He considers our frailties. He's compassionate towards our frailties and he pours out his, his mercy on us accordingly. So verse 15, as for man, his days are like gr grass as a flower of the field. So he flourishes for the wind passes over it and it's gone. Its place remembers it no more. So that talks about how temporary man is. We're fragile. We're, we're temporary. He says, but the mercy of the Lord is from everlasting to everlasting on those who fear him and his righteousness to children's children, to such as keep his covenant and to those who remember his commandments to do them. Isn't that good? His, his, his mercy, his righteousness, his kindness, it's forever. And so what David is telling us is that we should never forget all these loving merciful kindnesses and all these benefits that the Lord has poured out upon us. And for these things that David's talking about here, I want to thank the Lord. But not only that, as David is saying in the psalm tonight, I want to offer up a praise to him that will be pleasing to him. I want to 
be a blessing to the Lord. I want to bless the Lord too. I want Him to be able to look down at me and say, I'm glad I saved Him. I want God to be happy that He saved me in such a way that I'll be a blessing to Him. Then, as we move to verse 19, we see that David also wants to worship the Lord for another reason. Not just because of all the good things that he's done, but listen, listen to what he says in verse 19. He says, The Lord has established His throne in heaven, and His kingdom rules over all. And we should worship Him not just because He's good to us, but also because of His total majesty and His awesome glory, His overwhelming glory and His kingly state, His kingdom. He is king over everything and everyone. He is king of kings and lord of lords. And He's not going to be impeached. And He doesn't have to run the things He wants to do by Congress or the Senate. And they can't vote him down and they can't overrule him. And he didn't ask them when he made his law. He's God. And he's absolute sovereign over all and every knee will bow. It says in Philippians that at the name of Jesus, every knee should bow in heaven and in earth and under the earth. Every angel in heaven and every saint that's in heaven, every person that's on this planet right now, and every devil in hell and every person that's in hell will bow the knee and confess with their mouth that Jesus Christ is Lord to the glory of the Father. And he deserves to be praised just for who he is, King of kings and Lord of lords. So David goes on from here and he just kind of, he's been encouraging himself. Bless the Lord who, O oh my soul, all that's within me. Now he turns it outward. He says, okay, you guys too. And he encourages everything living to praise the Lord, including the mighty angels in heaven. Look at verse 20. He says, bless the Lord, you his angels, who excel in strength, who do his word, heeding his voice, the voice, the, the voice of His Word. Bless the Lord, all you His hosts, you ministers of His who do His pleasure. So he says, angels, you ought to be blessing the Lord too. You ought to be offering up worship to God that is pleasing to the Lord. And you know what? The angels do that. The angels do that. We read in Revelation chapter 4. We read in Isaiah chapter 6 about angels who they never cease in the throne room of God Day and night, they never stop saying, Holy, holy, holy is the Lord God Almighty. The whole earth is full of His glory. The angels worship Him. They bless His holy name. And then verse 22, David says, Bless the Lord all His works in all places of His dominion. Not just living things, but all His works, everything He's created. So living and inanimate. You think about that. All the things God has created, praise His name. The, the Bible tells us in Psalm 19, the heavens declare the glory of God and the stars His handiwork. You, you need only to look up at the sky and you don't have to know some language to understand the principle. The sound has gone out into all the earth. You don't have to travel anywhere. Wherever you're standing on planet Earth, you can look up in the sky and you can see the magnificent creation, the beautiful stars in the heavens, the, the moon. You can see them shining down during the night and you can know there's a great God who created this Earth, created everything in the universe. There's a great, mighty, wonderful God. And remember what Jesus said in Luke chapter 19 when He was coming into the city of Jerusalem and his disciples were, were shouting hosannas to him. They were, they were praising his name. And the, the, the religious Pharisees came up, and said, uh, came up to Jesus and they said, Master, tell your disciples to be quiet. Tell them to stop this. Jesus said, well, if I do, if they're silent, these stones will begin to cry out. These stones will praise me. We don't want some stone praising God in my place if I remain silent. I want to praise Him. I want to bless 
his name, make a joyful sound to him. Even the works that God has done, praise his name. And so David kind of comes full circle as he finishes this psalm, the same way he started talking to himself. Not like a crazy man, but speaking to the innermost part of his being. That he might truly worship the Lord from his heart in a way that pleases God and blesses God's heart. Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Can we say that together tonight? Bless the Lord, O oh my soul. Amen.